Welcome back to The Ballad of Dina and Andrea, a podcast showcasing songs and conversations in reaction to the story of Andrea Yates and Dina Schlosser, two women who murdered their children in the early 2000s. I wrote an album based on their story in the style of Appalachian murder ballads to create empathetic myths about these mothers. And with this podcast, I've been able to sit down with friends to talk openly about issues that come up from these songs, like religion, mental health, misogyny, our failing justice system, motherhood, grief, and more. Each episode, I'll tell a bit of the story, bring in a friend to chat, and share a song. Please note, in this podcast, we will discuss postpartum psychosis and depression, domestic abuse, suicide, infanticide, and religious zealotry. Please take care of yourself while listening. Also note, when I use the word women, I aim to include anyone who has identified as a woman, female, or femme at any point in their journey. Okay, here we go. So let me tell you about Michael Waranecki. He's a street preacher who graduated from the Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, before returning to his hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and creating his very own Christian evangelical church. Just came up with it in the early 80s. He was run out of Grand Rapids for uh, harassing people with his street preaching. He struck a deal with the city to have various charges dropped if he left. And since then, he and his family have been preaching their brand of Agip Christ prop globally. He has multiple warrants out for his arrest. He is also a musician. Preacher Warnecki says that music is a powerful tool to touch people of all walks of life. Why do religious creeps always have to use the word touch? It's so gross. <laughs> Why am I bringing this guy up anyway? Well, Rusty Yates, Andrea Yates' former husband, was a longtime follower of Warnecki and continued to be after he and Andrea got married. Now, Rusty brought Andrea into Warnecki's fold. It was not a good fit. And being a preacher with his very own church meant he could make up rules for his followers, just cherry-picked from the good book. Uh, rules like women were created to be servants. He has called women the daughters of Eve and contemporary witches, saying that they all inherit a witchcraft nature from Eve. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of right. But also that women are meant to be wives and help meet. Now, I've seen this spelled different ways with two E's and also like M-E-A-T and also sometimes spelled help mate. But uh, it means a helper or assistant in Webster's Dictionary. And biblically, it means about the same, but with more misogyny. Warnecki uses the word on his very own site in regards to his own wife as such. For some reason, I had always feared marrying someone and finding out they were not who I thought. I also had a fear of a contentious woman. So I had to make sure Rachel understood her place as my wife would be, as the scripture states, a uh, helpmeet. Cool. Cool. Cool, buddy. Sounds like baloney to me. He also preached that to hold a job and live in a home is against God. And, I mean, again, okay. But Rusty Yates liked that one a lot. So when Andrea had already given birth to a full house of four kids, Rusty bought a bus from Warnecki. They packed the whole fam family on a 350-square-foot bus, parked it in a Lazy Days RV camp, and lived there. Rusty would go to work sometimes. Those details are a bit hazy. But it is clear that Andrea would take care of and homeschool the kids. Since Rusty didn't believe in mainstream church, they didn't go to a church. So it seems like she was completely isolated and started to fall deeper into her depression, which she had struggled with for years. After her parents and family started to get concerned about her behavior and health, the Yates moved out of the bus and back into a house. Then Andrea's father died, and she got even more depressed. Encouraged by her church and her husband, she stopped taking her medication, uh, the devil's pills. Then, after an inadvisable fifth pregnancy due to previous postpartum depression and mental illness, they said, don't have that baby, but uh, she did. And she began falling even deeper into her depression. She would do things like pick at her lip till it bled and physically restrain herself from hurting herself or her kids by holding onto her thighs. She would grab so hard sometimes that there were bruises on her legs. She went into the hospital after a suicide attempt, but because the family's insurance ran out, she was kicked out. I'm jumping a little bit in time there. But during the time that after she had her fifth child... She was corresponding in letters with Michael Warnecki and his wife, Rachel. 
They told her that she was a bad mother and needed to repent. Andrea began to see cartoon characters on TV telling her that her children were eating too much candy and cereal and telling her that she was a bad mother. She believed she was controlled by Satan and that her children were tainted and not developing correctly. She had to save her kids from herself. She fixated on a particular piece of scripture. Matthew 18, 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. For this episode's song, I've used a bit of found text. Andrea was sent Preacher Warnecke's newsletter titled The Perilous Times, and in it there was a cartoon of a frazzled mother dealing with a full yard of misbehaving kids. In the days leading up to her children's deaths, Andrea, fueled by a Bible verse and untreated postpartum psychosis, fixated also on this image and its dogmatic limerick that I have put to song for you here on the podcast with the help of Drew Pearson producing, Taya Lux on harmonies, and banjo, John Conant on bass, and Victor Cohen on guitar. This one's not on the album, but here it is for you podcast listeners special. Modern Mother Worldly. Modern Mother Worldly was very, very lazy. All her children drove her crazy. The Bible told her to spank and train them. But society said she must never constrain them. The fruit of rebellion she did now see. On the day of judgment she will have no plea Modern mother world Cast in hell Now what becomes of the children of such a Jezebel My children were not righteous. I let them stumble. They were doomed to perish in the fires of hell. The way I was raising them, they could never be saved. They had to, they had to die to be saved. I killed my children because I'm a bad mother. I killed my kids. That's just sort of how I am. I need to be punished. I'm guilty. Destroy Satan. Right now I'm going to be speaking with one of my very dearest friends and collaborators from way, way back to our time in an all-female sketch comedy group called Meet. We were unapologetic, mad, and quite good, Um, but it was before the internet, so you'll never know how fucking great we were. (laughs) Since then, my guest has been the host and co-host of one of the most honest and inviting podcasts about parenting called One Bad Mother. So obviously I had to have her on to talk about being a bad mother. Get ready for loud laughing and inside jokes with me and Biz Ellis. Hi, Biz. Biz Ellis. That's who you are. Biz Ellis. That's who I am. (laughs) Right in those meat days. All right. Let's jump right in. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to talk a little bit about your podcast, One Bad Mother. What made you want to do it in the first place? And where are you with it now? It's And it's been on for 10 years. Is that? Oh, we're close to like 12, 13. Oh, my goodness. I I am a very good friend. (laughs) No, you're close. It's it's just hard to imagine podcasts have been around that long. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm old. So I'll take you back. One Bad Mother, a comedy podcast about parenting, not a parenting podcast. (laughs) Uh, That was the original thesis. It's turned more into things like stop feeling like shit for being a mom and (laughs) no, you're not in fact all alone. Uh, It's perfectly normal. Everything you're experiencing. Uh, But it started, uh, I used to live in New York. Where you and I met, and I used to be really cool, like super cool. Like I went to shows and la la la. la. Like if you saw me on the subway, you'd be like, "She's, she's definitely cool. she's cool. She's definitely not 
not cool. Um, and then I got pregnant. And then suddenly I felt uncool. I felt like people were looking at me in a way that was very different. And uh, then I had the baby, Katie Bell. And wow, people really uh, treated me differently. And I definitely didn't feel cool. I felt like most of the time, if I left the apartment, whether I was on a train or whether I was just walking out with a stroller, uh, that people were more put off <laughs> by the fact that uh, I had a human being uh, <laughs> with me. And I, I started like looking around and I didn't really feel that there was much of a space to be quote unquote cool and a mom. Yeah. And so... I want, at the time, there really weren't a lot of podcasts. I mean, things were still very blog oriented. And uh, I, we moved out here to California when Katie Bell, who's my oldest, was like two, you mm -hmm. know, just had turned two maybe. And I've been toying around with this idea of a podcast called One Bad Mother. And uh, uh, Stefan made me a t-shirt that said one bad mother on it. And it looked really cool. I felt like really cool in it. Um, yes. It, yeah, it was very cool. It was really cool. Put, put up a yeah, picture. It was cool. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I wanted to create a space that felt like I did in that shirt. I wanted to create a space that if the space was something physical and it was on the subway, people would be like, that thing is cool. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and so uh, I got out here and Stefan was like, oh, you should really meet this friend of mine's wife, uh, Teresa Thorne. And um, I was like, Ugh. and Teresa was like, Ugh. both of us were like, we have babies and we don't want to fucking like talk to another tired. mom. Another mom, because moms are lame. Anyway, yeah. uh, so we we met. I went out to meet Teresa and her baby without a child of my own at a playground. And if you really want to feel uncool, go be an adult without a child at a playground at like <laughs> nine in the morning. Oof. Uh, it is weird. But she and I started talking and then we started walking uh, together. And I began to realize that we were talking about similar experiences, but coming at them in very different ways. And this was sort of the height of the Mommy Wars storyline that was kind of being pumped by uh, media and by Mommy Wars working versus non-working. Oh, like, whatever yeah. you could yeah. do to fucking pit women against, women each, against other. each other. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you and I do this totally differently. And yet we're still friends. Maybe yeah. we should. And basically we, she agreed to do the podcast after not agreeing. She later then agreed. And we started <laughs> doing it and uh, we did it together for maybe nine years. And then during the pandemic, she had to step away. And uh, I've been doing it uh, since on my own. And we essentially became friends over the show and really like got to have some amazingly honest conversations about approaches to parenting. We definitely got to witness the expansion and acceptance of language around uh, gender and identity yeah. with our kids and with other people's kids, as well as neurodiversity and as well as just the realization of how um, especially can 13 years ago, the parenting field was dominated. Apparently the only people who could talk about parenting. And yes, I am a white middle-class college educated woman. <laughs> so I get to talk about parenting, whatever the fuck I want to. Oh yeah. You, oh yeah. yeah. I'm an expert. <laughs> You're an expert. Um, but like after we had had, I think like seven authors of color who had parenting books on and then could not find any more are, oh. and like had the, New York library book finder person. Oh. Uh, she couldn't find it anymore. We started really willfully 
purposefully going out and seeking as many different voices because we had the space for it. And Excellent. if Teresa and I were coming at parenting so differently and are still able to be friends, I wanted to have more of those conversations, for right? Sure. So yeah, so that, and we've been on and now uh, we're wrapping up our final year. It's the final season of One Bad Mother. Oh my God. I know. Anyway, so it's very exciting. Yeah. Do you have plans? Like no. Your, no. Okay. Not. Nope. <laughs> not <laughs> even. Not even a little. What day is it? Good. Tomorrow I'll have plans, and then the next day I'll be like, mm, I don't. And I don't then know. I'll sit uncomfortably in the not knowing. <laughs> I'm relaxing. Maybe, I'm relaxing. <laughs> I'm not not being productive. I'm relaxing. I need <laughs> 200 cats. Um, so yeah. So that's, well, good. I yeah. look forward to whatever it is, even if it is uh, having wine with you on the bench. Uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, the bench. Like there's the a bench. Hey, bench. We go to. Bench. We, just, <laughs> we don't really want to go inside a restaurant. And have a, just <laughs> right there on a bench. Just right on a bench. Paper yeah. bag. Bench it up. Yeah. Um. <laughs> What comes up when you think of one bad mother? I would say I've had an opportunity to listen to a lot of people. Mm. And I have been given a gift of the opportunity to get into discussions with them and change my way of thinking. Even if it didn't change my way of thinking, it opened my way of thinking up to being even more expansive and inclusive of like, oh, I remember, here's a great example. This is a good example. Early, early on in the show, I was like sharing a story with Teresa about having been at like <laughs> this Brooklyn street fair. And I was like, and there was a woman pushing like her six-year-old in a stroller. And I was all like into it. I was like, ah, I am never pushing my six-year-old in a stroller. <laughs> my six-year-old will, I guess, drive a car or like own a business. But <laughs> anyway, I was just like, I couldn't get my head around it. And then thank God for the listeners of One Bad Mother who are the nicest people. They set me straight in the nicest of ways. They like wrote and were like, hey, you know, I've got a kid who's neurodivergent and to walk while being that surrounded by uh, stimulation is really mm -hmm. difficult for them. And the stroller provides them sort of like a space to sit and block out and be able to get through it. And I was like, what a jerk I was. <laughs> and then I, so I started to be like, oh, why do I even care that that woman is pushing a six year old around? And it's like, why do I even care because it's clearly what works in yeah. that scenario and that situation at that moment. So now you apply that to pretty much any other thing that you come across in the world, be it parenting or whatever. Whatever. Right? And you and you start to go, oh, everybody's just literally doing the best they can in the moment that they're in. Yeah. And yeah, the world is full of raging assholes, but I'm going to have to go with the fact that most people aren't. And if somebody is struggling, that there's probably a reason for it. Is that, oh, is that person on their phone the entire time their kids in the play, you know, play ball pit? Yeah. Well, you know what? One time my dad was having, you know, surgery and I was on my phone the entire time. Does that represent me every day? Mm -hmm. I don't fucking know. Back we in, just don't know what's going on. We don't on. know. Yep. So just go out and assume the best. Also, yeah. like, is it harming anyone else? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. I know. So why we got to judge so much? Oh, we're so judgy. And you know what? Yeah. One of the things I think I've learned is that like, no one is doing it at you. That was like definitely a thesis that came up in the show several times where like, no one's dropping their kid off with a perfectly packed lunch at you. <laughs> Right. Like it's just something that happened. No one made their cake from scratch at you and no one bought a cake and dumped it. And, you know, no one bought a five hundred dollar cake at you. It's Ooh. cake. And it's, it's cake. delicious. It. Eat, it. Yeah. Eat it. It's cake. Eat it. Yeah. It. So, you know, yeah. And then uh, lastly, I'll just throw this out too, since I know it's where our conversation is going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I've learned a lot is that people don't know jack shit about women and their bodies and the way uh, female bodied people are treated 
uh, especially when it comes to their reproductive health, is it's, you know, I'd like to say shocking. But it, now it never progressed. It just never so it's like, progressed. It's not even it's not shocking because I mean, it is. It <laughs> is. But like in the context of the world now, it's shocking. But yeah. looking back and going, of course, nobody's yeah. ever cared. Nobody is still caring. Um, and I mean, I think that is changing, hopefully. But hopefully. Yeah. just in terms of politics, it certainly isn't. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, all right. Yes, we'll get yes. into that. <laughs> <laughs> Sip. <laughs> Sip of water. (laughs) Where's our bench, Becky? I know. (laughs) In terms of like a cultural context, Mm -hmm. thinking of bad woman, bad mother, um, what do you think people mean when they're saying that? Why do we why do we hate women so much, Biz? (laughs) Um, um, because we exist. Uppity women, whatever hysterical women, uppity women, you know, whatever it is, it is because you are. I, Becky, I don't fucking get it. I mean, I'd like yeah. to say it stems from the fact that, you know, female bodied people can create life, which, by the way, is fucking hard to do. And we need to stop telling people that, like, all you got to do is get in a car and you're pregnant when you're 16. <laughs> you know, it's you should be telling people when they're 16. It's actually kind of hard. You might wake up one day and be <laughs> like, why can't I have a baby? What's wrong with me? I was told it was supposed to be. So- Nothing's wrong with you. It's actually fucking pretty normal. I think there is this story that has been told forever about women somehow being able to make a baby, therefore unable to do anything else. And along Mm. with that, this connection to your only bodily purpose is to make life. And if you are not making life, then that is what ails you in all other ways. And Suffering is part of that, and therefore you should just take it that you will always be suffering, and that's God's plan, and that's nature's plan, and any steps you take to alleviate your pain or learn more about why your body's doing a thing, or not have children, or not (laughs) want to, or physically be unable to, therefore... Yeah. You're a horrible, like, it's just another way to use our bodies as an excuse to limit us. Yeah. From shame what us, we, limit to us. shame us, yeah. limit us. And, you know, heaven forbid you do get a kid in your house, you know, that just opens up 18 million more negative narratives, right? Like, oh, did you try and work while you had a kid? You're a nasty woman. Oh, mm-hmm. did you? stay home with your kid you're nasty you're horrible oh you put your kid in childcare. oh you're horrible we have a culture that blames us right away yet gives and provides no consistent standardized resources or cultural except i mean even just accepting the fact that babies are in the world would be really great sometimes <laughs> and not a nuisance for your flight or your table at the restaurant or like, I mean, it, whatever. It, it, this is, I, I was literally just talking to another mm-hmm. a, interview about this and that is it. And I know I've been on the end of like, sure. oh, like, like, oh my God. But it's like, when you I have to. Exactly. exactly. I have kids. I don't even want to sit next to them at a restaurant. I get it. All right. I get it. It gets to be both. It gets to be something you don't want to sit next to and something that you have to accept is going to be in the restaurant. Exactly. You know? Because we we're just so individual. Yeah. The individual is the most important. We can't accept that mm-hmm. community includes mm-hmm. everyone, young, old. Yeah. Oh, Everybody. we could go into yep. old too. Yeah, fucking be play old people too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> we we just take j- give us somebody to hate. Let's give, do it. We'll do it. We'll we will it. find we a way to do it. Make a bumper sticker <laughs> and for some reason proudly stick it on our car that we hate somebody. We will start a yeah. whole religion. Yeah, we will. Let's do it. <laughs> Speaking of yeah. that, <laughs> were, you, <laughs> were you raised religious? Yeah, kind of. I was uh raised my father was not a practicing religious person at all. He did not go to church on Sundays. Mama raised my sister and I Catholic. So Southern Catholic, I've never seen my vagina. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, and we were outnumbered in the South uh, as Catholics. Uh, we were, oh, yeah, we you lived were, in Baptist. You were, 
Baptist and Episcopal town. You were ethnic. I was ethnic, basically. <laughs> Somebody literally thought Catholics had horns. And I was like, at a young age, wow. being asked by another young age person, I was like, wow, <laughs> we should have more. I, I knew then we should have more conversations. Let's don't make assumptions. Maybe ask. Wow. Oh, no. um, but yeah, everything in the South, especially in the 70s and 80s, was very religious. <laughs> it yeah. was just normal. Uh, but I was Catholic and uh, we had to go to church every Sunday. That was in Sunday school. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was well, all right. You I had to... a cafeteria ca Catholic mom. She wasn't like, you know. Yeah. What was your favorite camp song? I have many favorites. One that I love to pull out here in Southern California, where I am, to my children and the children that are around them. It's just, it's a shocker. They love it. It goes, oh, if I had a little bitty box to put my Jesus in, I'd take him out and, and put him back again. And if I had a little bitty box to put the devil in, I'd take him out and bash his head and put him back again. <laughs> if I had a little bit of back. Anyway, so that's and to which the kids are all just like, what? what? They think it's hilarious. <laughs> um, and then there's a non-religious camp song that I've been singing. And I luckily have children who understand why it's problematic and why that's funny, but not in the scheme that like probably other people find it. Anyway, whatever it goes. Well, Miss Effie was her name, and the way she won her fame was being handy with the gun. And she drove the men insane. Well, she'd whip out her pistol and shoot most any guy. Then she'd sing out this alibi. I didn't know the gun was loaded. And I'm so sorry, my friend. My friend, I didn't know the gun was loaded. And I'll never, ever do it again. Again, it's sort of feminist. Wait. Well, one day she had a date with the wrestling heavyweight who had tried a brand new hold she did not appreciate. So she whipped out her pistol and shot him in the knee and she sang out this little plea. Yeah, she, every guy that she goes out with tries a little something she doesn't like. So she, and she shoots him. Yes. And so to me, it's an oh. anthem. You know, uh, I love this. I you know. know I, I got a lot of these. Yeah. Really? I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta do a cover. I, I know you got to do a cover. I'll get you. I'll get you a copy of all the different verses. She winds up with the judge, you know. I mean, like yes. it. She shoots that judge. She just, you know. Anyway, I'm not sure there are many camp songs that I grew up knowing <laughs> <laughs> that aren't potentially problematic. Yeah, yeah. Or I'm, mine were just. They were kind of like just super Christian lame. Oh, they're all super was, Christian. Like, yeah. oh, and then, of course, it was Green Lake Bible Camp. It was like Lutheran yeah. Bible Camp in yeah. Minnesota. So it was like, we're going to watch Counselor Mark sing more than words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A song that doesn't really want you to admit that you love a person. Why don't you just show me? And then we'll see how we feel after after you've shown me. Oh, then right. I got to go on and baptize somebody. It was always a lot of like, sorry, we can make out, but we can't be together because we won't be in heaven together. Oh my gosh. Because you're not a Christian. Because you're not a Christian. You're like, well, you but weren't we either five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> but you were Catholic, so you could do it in the butt. Mm -hmm. Any any time you want. In the butt. In, in the, the butt. butt. Yeah. <laughs> what is this a podcast about? I'm just kidding. Oh, I know. I'm like, ah! I have no idea. I'm going to figure ah! it out later after, <laughs> after all the other things done. No, yeah. oh, how do you feel after 10 years or 13 years of uh, this podcast and two kids under your belt? How do you feel about parenting rules and like rule books and things? Well, I, I think people are trying their best. Okay. When you have kids in your house, you do have a lot of moments that are really great and make sense. And you feel like you're nailing it. Sadly, I don't think we talk about how few and far between those can feel because the really hard things can take up a lot more. No one like wakes up at one in the morning overthinking what a great job they did, <laughs> right? Like, people wake up at one in the morning and are like, oh my God, when my child was four, Ugh. I used to count down when I was changing their diapers or like, wait, we got like, what is that going to play out as when they hear a countdown one day, right? Like it's you, <laughs> your kid sleeps. I mean, your kid doesn't sleep at night. Uh, everybody, everybody's else's kid sleeps, Becky. 
Oh, everybody. Sure. Mm -hmm. So whatever steps <laughs> that they took to do that, uh, you better do. And if you don't do them, you're doing it wrong. And so somehow your child not sleeping is your fault yeah. when no one thinks that way about adults and their sleeping patterns, right? Like it's right. just, it's, it's for some reason, for some reason, <laughs> when they're a baby, they better be fucking sleeping through the night, despite how I don't know many people who do, but whatever, <laughs> um, whatever, the guilt and the shame yeah. and the judgment around parenting, quote unquote, rules or styles or tips or whatever, my approach to them has always been check them out, realize they're not being, try to read them assuming they're not written at me and they're not making mm -hmm. a judgment about what I've done. And keep in mind that they don't know my kid and that I know my kid best and it trusting my instincts with my kids that like, you know what? Maybe my kid just isn't a sleeper at that time of day. Or mm -hmm. maybe my kid, like I got my second kid, Ellis, uh, is a quote unquote picky eater. Uh, and I just decided a lot of books will give you a lot of the rules and opinions on how to raise a non-picky eater. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, the kid doesn't want to fucking eat it. Yeah. And uh, there were like months where I would just be crying at dinner because I was trying to get everybody to eat the same thing. And it would always result in Ellis who had, has very big emotions, um, really screaming and yelling and crying, which would really make me scream and yell and cry. Cause again, we can talk about the rules that they don't talk to you about uh, that I feel would be more helpful. But like, and I finally was like, I don't want to spend another day being this sad oh. and broke dinner. Yeah. Like I just don't. And like, why am I? I'm actually much happier to make four different meals <laughs> than I am. Cause I mean, the picky one's not eating much of a meal. It's not like I'm, I'm like putting fucking the English muffin and a yogurt on the table. Right. Like right. Or a hot dog and a strawberry cut up. Right. Like that's yeah. dinner. That is yeah. dinner, everybody. <laughs> um, and I just, I just didn't want to be that sad anymore about it. And yep. I think parents find themselves in those situations feeling like it must be me. And I, I do think this is applicable to people who don't have kids in their house. This feeling that it's only you. And it would have been way more helpful if somebody had said in a book, you are going to be so angry that your kid is screaming at you that you're going to want to punch the wall. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know what? You might punch the wall. You, you are going to experience rage like you've never known. And you will not know what to do with it, knowing that you don't want to do anything to your child because they are just a child. Right. They cannot, they do not have the experience or wisdom of a 30 year old, right? Like they are, <laughs> they got like three years in the game and, <laughs> you know, so your expectations, so whatever fucked up expectations you think you're supposed to have about kids and milestones and whatever, we don't tell people uh, there should be a wide, a wide area of like give around whatever these milestones are, whatever you think you're supposed to be doing at a moment. We don't talk about the rage. Rage is really scary. Ooh, um, yeah. And depression is really scary. Sadness is really scary. The worry, anxiety, the people don't talk about postpartum anxiety. What I've learned over the years in learning about how little our medical organizations know about women and hormones and how like their impacts on how we can function in the world and not as a trope excuse of like, but she's just hormonal. But right. like there are, I've been reading books on perimenopause and menopause, which we know zero about. Um, <laughs> and how like women can experience like literally saying, I've never been an anxious person in my life. And then in the middle of perimenopause or menopause, I woke up and I couldn't leave my house. 
Wow. Yeah. And like the anxiety is you're like, I don't know where it came from. And it's because we have a lot of hormones that all do different things in our bodies. Men do not have the same amount of hormones. And, but we've only based all studies on male bodies because heaven yeah. forbid we look at a woman's body because it might fuck up their chance of having a child. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> and ick. So, like, <laughs> I think. I, I went in a big circle to get back to rules, but I think rules have to be taken with like a really big dose of salt. Some rules have been very helpful and some rules have little to do with me and my children. Yeah. I wish somebody had said rage. I wish somebody had said depression. I wish somebody had said talking with partners. I wish somebody had said, hey, these are the assumptions that you unintentionally are going to make about other parents or what parenting is. And my favorite of all times is somebody should have told you a kid may probably 99% chance poop in the tub <laughs> and you're going to clean it up. And then in probably an hour, you're going to get in that tub. Right? <laughs> like, and it, and like No one's like, get ready. Somebody's going to take a big shit in your tub <laughs> and you're going to get back. No one's like, hey, guess what? At some point you might be feeding or just holding a baby while you are on the toilet and yep. you're going to think I'm crazy and you're not. There are a hundred other people on your street sitting with a baby <laughs> on their lap while taking a dump and scrolling <laughs> on the phone, right? Like it's, it's those things I don't think that I think are more helpful rules then um, this, everything can be fixed by. Well, right. It's like it, the communication is more important than the rules. The yeah. sharing of information is more important than rules. What I have realized from doing the show is everything important to share, uh, we tend to tell people not to share miscarriages. Don't talk about it. You know, my favorite is don't even tell someone you're pregnant till oh. three months. I'm like, for whose benefit is that? Right. right. Like, how are, how are you going to get support for yourself when you go through something as difficult and as hard as a miscarriage? Yep. Uh, but you didn't tell anybody. Right. Right. And I, to me, that is earth shattering that we don't share enough stories so that people feel so alone during a loss like that not talking about infertility and how hard it is to get pregnant and how wrong and how many people feel that somehow it's their fault that they've done something for this thing that it is naturally naturally occurring occurring yep. uh, um depression don't talk about that they'll take your baby away don't you know like, yeah. <laughs> like all of it 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 oh Just are you peeing when you sneeze <sighs> Don't talk yeah. about that. Talk about that. Every, everybody's doing that. So you know what? goes back to that point. We have been told that suffering is part of our experience as female bodied people. And therefore, anything that is uncomfortable, ranging from uncomfortable to terrible, is just something we should accept. Yep. And therefore, we don't as a society need to explore a solution to Right. Just take it. Yeah. Just accept it. Just accept it. That's what grandma did mean. it. Yeah. Well, that's not a good excuse. I feel bad for grandma. Right. I wish grandma had a better life. Yeah. Uh, sorry, like, grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you have callers calling in with mm. this stuff a lot or with um, yes. postpartum depression yep. or psychosis? Yeah. Yeah. We get, we accept three calls on our hotline, uh, genius moments, which are just really about the dumbest thing that might be like, no one, here's, here's the reality for you, Becky. No one gives a <laughs> shit about what you're doing. It feels like, it feels like everybody cares, but no one does. And really no one gives a shit about what you're doing as a parent, for sure. Like yeah. all so the little victories. I venture to say globally. Globally. Like, who cares what you're doing as much as you do? Yeah. Right. So like, let's say your kid actually slept through the night. Now you had nothing to do with that, but you would like to get out of your car at Target and just have a <laughs> high five salute going up and down the aisle, right? Like that's what you want. So that's the genius. And it can be anything. And then the fails are the ones that can be funny or they can be honestly. I remember one time I was so tired and I was so strung out with Ellis who really didn't stop screaming for like years. And I was so like on the edge all the time. And we're trying to get out of the car at this car rental place. And I've got him in my arm and I shut the door on us. And like it, it gets his arm and he was fine. But I felt 
like a fucking monster. And it really was okay. And what I learned was it was okay. I mean, there are certainly times when things are not okay, right? But it's not, that's part of that issue of it's all or nothing, right? Like when we talk about postpartum depression, a lot of the images that I think people think of are what is really postpartum psychosis, yeah. right? And because that's the extreme we think of, that any indication we might show of having postpartum depression, people will assume that, you know, like, and it, your kid rolled off the bed, okay? That happens a lot, everybody, and it <laughs> happens quickly, 90% of the time, it really is actually very fine. Yes, kids can get hurt, right? But the guilt of the fall as the parent makes you feel like you're the person whose child drowned falling off the bed, right? Like yeah. whatever, or that you, it's like whatever the most extreme case is. And I will tell you, years of listening to calls and years of talking to guests, what I really take into account when hearing any story about any parent <laughs> is there is so much more going on than whatever this spin is. I think about that woman whose kid got into the gorilla cage like several years ago. And I was talking to Teresa recently and she was like, I always think about that woman. I'm like, I do too. I think about this poor woman. Cause like, if you've got a kid that's a, not a runner, then you don't know. But if you have a runner where you, that child is always fucking running, you cannot stop that child from running away from you. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have 20 people with you no. that are all have the job of keeping that child within a sight line. That, that child, child is going to run. Is to run. Is their to their run. motivation is the fucking run. I am yeah. going to run and I am going to crawl into a thing and I'm going to be on top of a thing. And like, mm -hmm. heaven forbid, you fucking looked in your purse to get something to eat, right? I'm not, I don't know what the circumstances were. But right. that kid wound up in a fucking gorilla. Let me tell you who suffered the most. <laughs> that mom who for the rest of her fucking life is known as the gorilla mom. Yeah. Who grew her child in the gorilla. Exactly. Being a little over like attention. It. She not paying attention every second, right? And then oh. you wonder why... You wonder why when people say like self-care is bullshit, it's because what is really, what is the expectation of everyone around you when you want to take a break? What does that look like? Are, are you supposed to stay vigilant when you're like resting, right? Like you yeah. can't, can't be vigilant 24 hours a day. I mean, most people, they get a kid in their house and then like, oh, I'm going to get three hours. Two of those hours is going to be trying to figure out what the fuck to do. <laughs> and then the last hour is you feeling like shit because you didn't do anything. And right. then there's a kid right back there. And let me tell you that I've yet to figure out what to do with three hours that isn't that scenario. Yeah, I have that as yeah. a non-child yeah. person. Right. I cannot imagine it. And then it's just times a billion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a oh, lot. Man. Yeah. Oh, my it's God. just it's a lot. Like, and it's I don't think we give each other enough credit for the fact that it's a lot. Yeah. Were there any surprising challenges or elements that came up for you in regards to bodily autonomy? After oh, yeah. Kids? Yeah. Yeah. Um, less so with Katie Bell, my first, they, you know, I didn't really have an opinion one way or the other on breastfeeding. I wound up breastfeeding Katie Bell. She also took a bottle really easily. And in six months, she was just like, I'm good. And I was like, great, I'm good too. <laughs> Ellis breastfed for almost a year, which is a lot longer than I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I'm also not a huge touch person in general. And which is funny because I married somebody who's like language is all touch. Um, and when you have kids, they want to touch you. And there was something about Ellis as a baby uh, had to be with and on me all the time. Like I couldn't mm -hmm. put him down if he and he would start screaming and I was alone with him and I couldn't handle the screaming. So like and even when we got a like a sitter like he screamed sometimes the entire times that I was gone. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, as soon as you leave, they'll be fine. For Ellis, it wasn't. Yeah. And like that 
talk about shame and guilt there, right? So after a while, I dealt with, I mean, I definitely had postpartum after Ellis, but one of the things that I shouldn't have been surprised by, but was, is that I felt like I was in a relationship with someone who, like a male dominated relationship where I couldn't get out, right? Right. Like I couldn't, I am, um, uh, I was raped in college so I've always had a little, a uh, little of that fun trauma to carry around with me, yeah. but like it felt very abusive. That's the word I want to use, um, which is a weird word to associate with a baby. And again, I think there are deeper questions that we should be willing to explore. Yeah, but I couldn't leave or do anything because the child had to be. I knew I was depressed because I referred to him as the child and the boy for like a long time, and I was like, oh. But I, he does have a name. I am, um, I am distancing myself. I am in distancing. A weird way. <laughs> like he had to feed all the time, and he and he wouldn't take a bottle. And thank God, some babysitter gave him a sippy cup at like the age of nine months, which is not when you give a baby a sippy cup. But I was like, it's something other than me. And like it, and it was all fucked up. Like I, I really felt trapped, and I really didn't like it. And I. Like I definitely was resentful and I didn't like Ellis all the time. And there's, you know, I, like that was part of, I mean, I fucking love that kid. Oh, um, and yeah, I like, I also, thanks to the podcast, firmly believe none of us should have to do disclaimers of how much we love our kids. Of course you fucking love the kids. It's not a podcast is. about loving your kid. It's right. a podcast about you as a person who has a kid in your house and how that makes you feel. And, um, it was a lot of work. And even now, like I am his emotional regulator and we've been doing, he's narrowly uh, diverse or differently wired. I love that expression too. Oh, yeah. um, and we have worked with Ellison therapy and me in therapy of just like him learning that resilience and needing it less and less, but like, it's still, I'm still triggered. Like if Stefan does something that sets all us off, I'm just like, for fuck sake <laughs> because i have to deal with the emotional fallout of this right, right? like fuck it, fuck it, fuck, fuck, fuck. and it's hard to find especially when they're really little the time to sort of regain body autonomy or even like mm-hmm. an hour of i mean back then if the cat crawled in my lap i'd be like for fuck sake get off of get me, off of me! <laughs> um but i was incredibly lucky that i had while we didn't have a lot of people around physically to yeah. help you know stefan was very i was in a supportive relationship my parents were supportive you know i had places to vent i had therapy i had a lot of resources to help you know i was able to access medication mm-hmm. uh, and this is not true for a lot of people uh, a lot of people are in environments where it's not okay to feel that way or to you will feel bad if you tell somebody you don't want your kid on you yeah right for even a minute right yeah i'm so glad that you had the support that you did have and but, but it yeah. makes me understand when i hear those stories of you know the villain mom hmm. out there you know i i'm like look there are days I've wanted to drive off for milk and not come back. I know women who have been found on the roof, curled up in the fetal position, crying, and they can't go back to that baby. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I know these people. I've seen yes. these people. I have come really close to being those people. And and again, I am in a in an environment with education and resources and support. Mm-hmm. I am not in an abusive relationship. I am not in a religious community that has unrealistic expectations. I am not, you know, working three jobs to make ends meet. I'm not, I, ah, yeah. I don't have kids with like needs that uh, require like even more. Right. That me. you can't meet with the resources right. you have. Yeah. 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 And I feel like even with all that, as a mother, you are or were really isolated oh, just yeah. in the way that culture sets up motherhood. Yeah, It's like, well, that's your business. Yeah. You'll no. get no money for it and you'll get no yeah. rewards. 
No support. The yeah. Love the biggest reward. Ah, of all. the biggest reward. We have a we made a pin called your here's your parenting reward. Here it is. <laughs> Did, do you feel better? Do you feel sane? No, but that isolation is real from the callers. I would listen to callers who would call in and really say how alone they feel, even though they're surrounded by people. And I know that for some people, they really are isolated. They're out in the fucking middle of nowhere. And I think the community that came out of the podcast, which is a really remarkable community that I am so glad exists in the world, that sense of isolation is addressed and it is a place for people to feel less alone and to know that they're not alone. You know, like we have people who have come out as trans halfway through their marriages. We certainly have people who've used vaccines in communities where they are not supported. We have people who are supporting their kids in ways that they weren't able to or getting out of abusive relationships. I mean, there's some like heavy shit out there that I certainly didn't think we were going to tap into in the show. And a lot of it, I'd like to think, comes from the realization that you are not alone. And if I say I say that at the end of every fucking show, you're doing a good job and you are not alone. I don't know. People need to hear that, whether that's with kids or without kids. You're not fucking think, alone. Yeah. There yeah. are people around who can help you or help you or yeah. yeah. And I guess on that topic, How can communities help support birthing people better? Listen, stop dismissing what a person is telling you. If somebody tells you something hurts and you do something to stop it and they say it still hurts, don't roll your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't be like, well, just get over it. Like, when I think about pelvic exams, when I think about reproductive devices like, you know, birth control devices, Uh, when I think about pregnancy, delivery, uh, when I think about breastfeeding, when I think about anything or post-delivery pain, when I think about people saying this hurts and how much it is dismissed to the point where where women really more than you think, though (laughs) probably women are listening, so they know, say, all right, just do it, right? Like I've, I've now said five times that it hurts and now I just feel like I'm annoying you, that my pain and my request to not feel it is an annoyance to you and somehow a bother <laughs> to your day in taking care of me. I'll just shut up and take it is awful. And yeah. it is such a part, this, uh, this idea that a woman who's pregnant suddenly doesn't know anything about their body anymore, right? Right. So whatever you think you're feeling, it's normal and it's not, right? Or, and especially women of color who are dismissed because of systemic notions of different levels of pain acceptance, yeah, which is the craziest thing in the world to assume, but that people still Still think it's true. Yep. It is, you know, or just that listening when you think there's something up with my kid that is different and I want to explore it. Like I had a friend who like when her kid was in first grade, she was like, I think this kid is dyslexic, right? I really think there is something hindering my kid or or a different way my kid is thinking uh, that isn't fitting into this. And the school kept telling them, we don't test for that until like the end of second grade or third grade. And her being like, but I really think my kids should be tested now, right? And this dismissal of your instinct, this dismissal of your requests for service, like, so that would, that's my big one. Fucking listen and actually do all you can to alleviate whatever the issue your patient or your friend or your partner is expressing. Right. So that's, that's number one, but blue sky, dude, I want fucking paid family leave for both partners or whoever the caregiver is. I understand that like, there are a lot of people who choose to have a baby on their own. So they get it. You know, uh, so that the working partner, whoever the partner is who's not carrying the baby can be home 
with to support and have a foundational relationship start with that kid and with the, and I don't know maybe you don't have a relationship I don't know everybody's like <laughs> family's different but like money and resources yeah. real real money real mental health not yeah. Dial a health, though that can be incredibly helpful when you need it, mm -hmm. but like real resources. Real resources, not just like, oh, here's another chore you have to do. Yeah, here's but like, here, yes, go find a, go find your own therapist while you're yeah, also go, doing this. While you're depressed and go spend 18 hours on the paperwork, yeah. 18 hours on the calls that you have to make. Jesus Christ. But the number of times where I have been like, wow, I just literally spent three to four hours scheduling appointments, following up on insurance, following up on a school related thing. And I'm, again, I'm your stereotypical woman. I'm white and I'm educated and I have resources yeah. and I can, I have access to a computer, right? Like, yeah. and I don't have a job that required my time elsewhere to the degree that many people, many people do. Yeah. And what are you gonna do? Come home and fucking fill that shit out in the two o'clock in the morning when there's no one on a hotline to help you if you need it. Yeah. It's crazy. So it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot. And we don't, unless we can, as a collective society say, it's a lot. And I'm going to stop hating women. Yeah. <laughs> Period. Yeah. I like, and that's looking back at myself. Right. Oh, for sure. We grew up in this same misogynist culture. Yeah. We, there's no way that stink's not going to get on us. Yeah. I know. Yeah, exactly. I just. <laughs> Where's my bench, Becky? I know. <laughs> when you said that about like ugh, just wearing you down and said, fine, I'll do it. Yeah. That is how we treat sex with women. Yeah, it's is true. Yeah. Yes. It's how we treat everything with women. Exactly. Yeah. Just ugh, the, break them down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, honey, we gotta. We need to go find a bench and talk about Stormy. I haven't even sat down with it yet. I again, you know, I didn't say anything. I know I didn't say no. I just didn't say anything. Oof! Wow. Two last questions: Were no. there any specific resources that you would recommend for postpartum depression, mm -hmm. psychosis, or the spectrum, um, mm -hmm. or for parenting in general? Okay, yeah. the first resource would be poison control. I cannot. Wow. Sing the praises of fucking poison control. You know who doesn't judge you? Poison control. They love your calls. They want you to call them all the time. And there's nothing that they have not heard. And they are not going to shame you or make. What's I have Katie Bell, like half of one of those like weird, squishy, fucking toxic animals that like everybody <laughs> gives out that are just literal garbage. Uh, she ate half. That kid was eating a lot of stuff. She ate half, and then she got it freaked out. She came in, she was like, I ate half of it. And I was like, you did what? And she was like, I ate half of it. What? <laughs> like, it's a lot of like, you're not a dumb child. Why did you eat half of it? Anyway, she was freaking out. Am I going to die? And I had just had a She was old enough to know. Oh, yeah. Old enough to know it might kill her. Yeah, no, this is like, it's not like last year, but she was old enough to know. And I was like, oh, my God. And I had luckily had poison control on the show as a guest. Ugh. And so I knew that they were not going to shame me. And I called and I told them and they gave me the correct answer, which was it's this too shall pass. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were so they were so great. Uh, so that's one. Never feel bad for calling poison control about anything. I called them once when I was in high school and we all oh, yeah. smoked a bunch of banana peels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were like, oh, no, we're going to die. Because no. <laughs> it's not even real weed. Oh, <laughs> right? God. Um, we drooled a lot. And that is, yeah. we'll drool, but yeah. probably will not die. <laughs> but it was just kind of like, well, it depends on what kind of pesticides we're using. <laughs> They're like, well, you're right. Fine. Don't <laughs> What is it? Consumer Reports just ruined blueberries for me forever. What? I don't even want to know. I'm no, eat my what? Ah, uh, <laughs> so poisonous. All right. On every one of our shows, we list a variety of places on our show notes. We always list a link to uh, these mental health resources, including Therapy for Black Girls, which is at therapyforblackgirls.com. Uh, we also do the... 
uh, postpartum support international hotline. There are a lot. Actually, they call it a warm line, which I really like. Nice. Um, and that's a phone number. There's also Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and they can provide a lot of different resources. Uh, of course, the Suicide Prevention Hotline and the Crisis Text Line, and we link those up for the USA as well as Canada and the UK. And the National Sexual Assault Line. I mean, I, and the National Domestic Violence Hotline. I mean, these are all resources that are out there. Um, they're not perfect, but they are trying to provide resources and help. I also highly recommend, whether it's online or in real life, just finding voices that resonate with you when it comes to parenting. Um, I mean, those are the big ones. Suicide yeah. Hotline, can't recommend that one enough. Suicide Hotline, uh, as well as the National Domestic Violence Hotline and Poison Control. Because, you know, these are real things that are everywhere. Yeah. Is there an artist or a book? Okay, I'll tell you one of my favorite books to read. If you want to have a good time reading something that will also make you be like, oh my God, they really don't know anything about my body. Unwell Women by Eleanor Cleghorn. I read it in a car in Carline over summer, picking my kid up from summer camp. It was like a beach read for me. I loved it so much. So very, very much. And then, hold on, get this correctly. I, look, One Bad Mother has a book. Uh, it's been out for way too long. I don't even know if you can get a copy called You're Doing a Great Job, 100 Ways You're Winning at Parenting. We tell you that somebody's going to poop in your tub. Uh, we do. <laughs> yeah. One Bad Mother will tell we you. We will tell I'm you. Gonna, but gonna, come listen to the podcast. We'll make you feel better. Uh, one of my favorite authors who I really like, her name is Carla... Uh, Nomberg. She's written several books. I really like her so much, but one of the ones I enjoy the most is You Are Not a Shitty Parent. Uh, how to Practice Self-Compassion and Give Yourself a Break. She's a doctor. She's absolutely wonderful, and I adore her. And if you really, really want a very easy read, good gift for Mother's Day or Father's Day, there is a wonderful, funny person. Uh, and we just did, we've done two episodes with her recently. Her name is Glenn Buzan. And she has two, like, they look like children's books. And one is called, There Are Moms Way Worse Than You. <laughs> Irrefutable proof that you are indeed a fantastic parent. And they have a new one, There Are Dads Way Worse Than You. Uh, Darth <laughs> Vader is way worse than you. Okay. <laughs> there are animals that eat their young. That you're doing a better job than them. So yeah, you're better, you're better than a hamster. You're better than you are better than a hamster. Yeah, that's right. You are much better than a hamster and a gerbil. So yeah, right, they set that babies. bar. Set that <laughs> my bar cousin was like, I can't eat shrimp because my hamster. <laughs> 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 oh, oh my god i love you so much I thank love you so much for talking to me yeah. Yay. Yay. And, um, yeah thank you and if that will end there because i know you've got things to do we'll um, end there good good night becky let me find a camp song good night, I camp with becky. Good night <laughs> becky it's time to say good night go to sleep now becky <laughs> If you'd like more information on postpartum psychosis and depression, please go to postpartum.net. There are additional links to mental health, safety, and reproductive resources in the show notes here, as well as links to information mentioned in the show. You can listen to the full album of songs for The Ballad of Dina and Andrea on Spotify and Apple or wherever you listen to your music. Songs were written by me, Becky Poole, and produced by award-winning multi-instrumentalist, folk musician, and incredible producer, Abby Posner. Find her at abbyposner.com. Theme also composed and played by Abby. Special thank you to Evan Mosier for sound sweetening, Julie Rosing for help producing, and to Andrew and the team at Voice Tracks West in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for listening, and please join me in future episodes as we explore more themes in the ballad of Dina and Andrea. Andrea.